Thanks everyone for tuning in to the first Carbon Farming webinar brought to you by WANTFA. This will be the first in a series that was being run, so keep a look out for the topics and dates of the next webinar. Today's topic on the life cycle assessment of greenhouse gas emissions in cropping systems will be delivered by Aaron Simmons. Aaron is currently working for the Department of Primary Industries of New South Wales, so I'd like to thank Aaron for presenting to us today. Before Aaron starts though, I'd like to share a couple of photos with you just to test the systems working. So this first one is just some chaff carts taken last harvest. This second one is just of a crop taken late last year. And the last one is just a nice photo taken after finishing seeding this paddock. Now, if you're hearing everything, can you please raise your hand? That's the little person icon at the top of your screen, just to show that you can hear everything. Okay, I can see everyone can hear. So can you please just lower your hands now? Now, if you do have any questions for Aaron, you can see the chat section at the bottom right of your screen, so please type in your questions there as we'll keep you all on mute. And now I'd like to hand over to Aaron. Okay, thank you, Joe. Can everybody hear me? I'll assume that they can. If you can't, type in the bottom. Now, I do apologise. It's the... Uh, first time that I have done this. So, Joe, I need to get this into, um, I can't scroll through. What am I doing wrong? Apologies for this. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> I've had to go to full screen um, to do this, so I can't actually see if people are flagging anything. Um, so we might just wait until the end if that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, I'll just I'll give a brief. I haven't got any slides to talk to about it, but I'll give a brief overview of what life cycle assessment uh, actually is. Um, then I will go into uh, some of the reasons that we're actually starting to use life cycle assessment. Uh, in our research and New South Wales DPI uh, is using life cycle assessment primarily for um, greenhouse gas mitigation strategies for the development of those. Uh, and then I'll actually go through some results from um, two existing research projects that we've been working on. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, well, it's no, sorry, it is, it's a, it is now an existing project, so it's a project that I'm running on a national, a national grains project looking at climate mitigation in national grains using LCA. Um, I've been that used to talking about the work coming up, but it's actually well and truly, uh, it's well and truly underway. I'm just going to try. And, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. So can somebody put their hand up if they can hear me? Okay, cool. David, thank you. Okay, so, oh, I can scroll through. Okay. Sorry, I'll, don't mind, I won't get onto the drivers yet. So, LCA, um, what is life cycle assessment? The easiest way of looking at it is a way of modelling the environmental impacts of a system. So, life cycle assessment was originally developed uh, to make comparisons between the, uh, the environmental impact of, say, a ceramic mug versus a paper mug or a paper cup. And it would go through, when they, when they say life cycle, it encompasses the entire life. So from cradle, so for a ceramic mug, that would be digging up the clay and the diesel used in the machine that digs up the clay through to processing it, turning it into a mug, firing it, and it would tally up every single thing that could be quantified that went into it, whether it was electricity, um, coal for the, for the furnace, the diesel to dig it up, 
all those kind of things through to disposal. So it would also look at the impact of what happens if you've had a mug for 10 years and you throw it in the bin, well, what happens? What is it actually, what type of things does that mug when it goes into landfill emit to the environment? And then it would compare that to um, a paper cup. And so it would take into account, for example, you know, chopping down the forest, the, um, the well, actually, we'll say the recycling from, from a waste product of recycled, uh, recycled paper, and then through the whole pro processing phase, so you've got a paper cup, and then you throw that in the bin, and that goes to landfill. And so throughout all those stages of production and waste, um, there's essentially emissions to the environment, whether it's to the atmosphere, whether it's to water, whether it's to soil, and it's life cycle assessment is a way of quantifying that. Now, one important thing you have to take into account is that um, there's a term called functional unit. And so if you said the functional unit um, for a comparison between coffee cups uh, was, you'd have to have a functional, functional unit of uh, 10,000 cups of coffee because that ceramic mug may last 10,000 cups of coffee, which means you need to compare one ceramic mug to 10,000 paper cups. So you've got to make sure that you're looking things on a looking at things on an even um, on an even scale, I suppose. Uh, so what we're doing now, we've picked up that. Well, not just us, but around the world, people have picked up that and they said, well, let's start applying this framework to agricultural systems. And we're focusing primarily on crops, cropping systems um, at the moment. But the important distinction uh, between the example I gave you of those cups and a cropping system is that when we're applying life cycle assessment to a crop system or any agricultural system, we actually use a cradle to gate um, framework. So essentially the assumption is, is that once, um, once a product moves beyond the farm gate, then it's out of the farmer's control. So we really can't look at, you know, we can't use LCA uh, to develop strategies to mitigate um, environmental impact if it's after the farm gate because that's not part of the production system that the key key person, the farmer, is actually involved in. So I hope that I hope that gives a bit of a bit of an overview of what life cycle assessment is. Um, I'll I'll move I'll start talking uh, to the slides now. So because some of the reasons that New South Wales DPI um, is doing this work. Um, I guess from an environmental perspective, it offers us an opportunity to actually model systems and then model alternative systems uh, to see how that may change the environmental impact. And I guess the important thing to remember is that it's relative. So even though we may not be modelling the, the wheat system example, that for example, that um, every single person in Australia uh, uses because really very few people use the same thing, you're making relative comparisons and we're, we're really looking at how changes can make a relative difference to, um, to that system. Um, but it also, it also will hopefully um, identify opportunities so we can say, well, LCA is, has um, LCA has identified these areas as potential areas that we could improve the environmental performance of an agricultural system. And so it kind of provide some guidance towards that decision-making process as well. Um, there's also an economic driver for it. So one of the big ones which is highly relevant to WA croppers is the, I don't know how many people are aware of it, the EU Renewable Energy Directive Scheme. Um, well, no, I don't think it's a scheme, it's just a Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, and so what the EU have done back in 2012, they actually uh, put, they legislated that any, uh, any biofuel supply or, or feedstock material had to show a, a greenhouse gas um, emissions benefit over its fossil fuel counterpart. So where this is particularly important for WA growers is that um, a lot of the canola that's grown over there goes into the EU market for biodiesel production. So up until now everything's been fine because uh, the, the WA canola producers were growing it at quite good um, or relatively good uh, greenhouse gas emissions scale, uh, but 2000 and well next year I think I think is going to be the crunch time when suddenly some people are going to uh, 
have to demonstrate that they're doing better than what they've been doing in the past. So it gives us an eye, and, and LCA is a framework that people like the EU actually use um, to go through and make, you know, determine some of these things as part of the assessment process. So, you know, we really need to think about climate mitigation strategies for the canola industry, and there's ongoing work around that now, just so that we can demonstrate it may be that the current, uh, it may be that the current accounting methods are incorrect, and we're going to demonstrate that they're wrong and we're better off. It may be that there's going to, there's really going to need a, a shift of practice change in canola growing over around WA to make if they if they still want to maintain the um, EU market access for the biodiesel uh, for the biodiesel market. So there's a strong economic driver for that as well. Um, from a policy perspective, um, if LCA is done right, um, well first I guess if LCA is done wrong it can actually be misleading. But if it's done correctly then it's a good it's a good thing for policy makers to um, consider when they're actually developing policy. Um, I, I guess it's worth, in my mind, it's worthwhile pointing out that like any modelling approach, you know, the two things, one, the, the outputs are only as good as the inputs, but it's also how you um, how you look at the actual outputs and, and how you interpret those that give it the meaning. So, you know, things can be taken the wrong way, but we're getting a good handle on it now. So I'm, I'm confident that it will, you know, the type of work we're doing will be able to, um, will be able to inform policy uh, makers throughout Australia, maybe even internationally. Uh, but that, that once again that will be important. Um, and there's just there's, you know, I guess from uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, there's a growing awareness of I guess there's growing demands from consumers in making sure that, you know, that their uh, their food and their other things are grown in an environmentally sustainable way. And I guess one of the things that we can show is that, you know, relative to the rest of the world, Australia's Seems to be travelling quite good, but it's also a way of, you know, putting a number on that. So if people do want to, you know, get up in arms because they think, uh, you know, they think wool growers are killing the world or whatever, well, we can say, well, it's a hell of a lot better than synthetics, for example. You know, so it's a way of, it's a way of uh, meeting consumer demand, and a lot of industries are now starting to look at this, the whole environmental stewardship thing, and you know, LCA is an ideal framework for actually. Being able to compare the environmental stewardship of different um, different products on a on a comparable basis kind of thing. Um, look, this is actually quite weird sitting here talking to a computer. Uh, are there any questions yet? I mean, did, has anybody got a question? Have I explained things adequately? No, no hands have come up, so I'll assume that's a yes. Actually, can somebody just put their hand up so I know you can still hear me? Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Amanda. Um, okay, so pretty much the first study that New South Wales DPI did um, to just see how this would work, you know, how LCA would work in a in a cropping environment. Um, it was a bit of a pilot study for the New South Wales Central Zone. So over um, over this side of the country um, in New South Wales. We really have, um, you know, crop, what's done in cropping systems is driven strongly by rainfall, um, as well as rainfall seasonality. So, the New South Wales Central Zone, which you can see in the map down the bottom there, Sydney. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but Sydney's. If you go halfway north to south in that zone and go straight across to the to the coast, that's where you'll see Sydney. Or oh, sorry, that's where Sydney is. So it's, a, a, you know, around the latitude of Sydney. Uh, it's west of the Great Dividing Range. Um, it's got a winter dominant rainfall. It does well, actually. Not necessarily winter dominant. Can be slightly winter dominant. I'll use that phrase. Um, and it's, the rainfall is between 600 and 700 millimetres of rain annual average rainfall per year. So that was the zone that was used to um, to to do this study on a uh, New South Wales DPI gross margin was used for all the inputs and so um, the yield inputs and all the, um, just so we had a, a common framework. So all the herbicides and pesticides that were used for the wheat and the, the nitrogen rates and everything else were, came from a New South Wales DPI gross margin. Um, so the assumptions in that model were that the yield would be 3.5 tonnes per hectare. Um, 
it would have been um, would have been targeting uh, just general wheat, I'd say, uh, 130 kilograms and 100 kilos of MAP, so about 70 kilograms of, of nitrogen. Um, part of the part of the uh, development of that was to determine w which emissions came from on-farm sources and which emissions came from pre-farm. So it's important to recognise that um, the emissions that come from the production of urea and MAP, for example, are actually attributed to this tonne of wheat. Um, and there were some changes, uh, potential changes to practices that um, they trialled, I guess, to see what the impact of those were. Um, okay, so what they found was that, um, <clears throat> pardon me, was that it took approximately 200 kilograms of CO2 equivalent uh, to produce a uh, produce a ton of wheat for that zone. Um, they looked at what would happen um, if you replace some of your uh, fertiliser nitrogen with biologically fixed N, so assuming that you are growing a, uh, a legume crop prior to the wheat crop. Oh, Kayleen, sorry, I saw a hand go up. Well, was that an accident? Okay, sorry. I'll keep on going. Um, well, okay, Lenny, feel free to ask a question if uh, if you want to do so now. I'm just looking to see if anybody's typing anything anywhere. I can't I can't see anything. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so, growing legumes prior to the wheat, so you're using that biologically fixed end, um, decrease the emission of the uh, the wheat crop. Um, also, that if you increased your, if you if you got a better yield, for example, rainfall, so essentially you're getting more more wheat for the same amount of nitrogen that you've put on in fertilizer, um, that reduces the, the the greenhouse gas intensity of a ton of wheat. Um, and then there's a thing called an emissions factor. So under the IPCC, there's a you know, the IPCC framework because um, emissions from nitrogen fertiliser, so nitrous oxide emissions in particular from denitrification. Um, because they're so variable depending on climate, um, well, I guess rainfall intensity, soil type, you're going to get more denitrification in clay soils than you will in sandy soils generally. Or it's going to take more water to, to get denitrification in sandy soils. Um, they've just come up with a, an emissions factor. So for example, in this model, they assume 22% of the nitrogen put on was lost uh, to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide, and so they adjusted that to 15% to see what difference that would make. So the overall picture that we get, and particularly from the pre-farm and the on-farm, so this this is essentially just looking at the the base scenario. Um, the the pie is split up between on-farm emissions and and pre-farm emissions. Um, and you can see that the biggest piece of pie there comes from. Uh, oh, I'm getting a thing from Joe. Okay. Um, the biggest piece of pie came from um, nitrous oxides from fertilizer use. Um, diesel use was also a, a major contributor to um, CO2 emissions, um, and then the other ones were the production of urea and production of MAP. Um, it's also also important to note that you'll see on the, the kind of the nine o'clock point there's a, a dark one CO2 from urea, so as well as nitrous oxide, um, as well as nitrous oxide. Um, so yeah, urea when it hydrolyzes emits carbon dioxide, so it can be quite emissions intensive even though it's got a high end in, um, in analysis. So that that was the end result from that. I guess that um, that first cut at giving it a go was published by PIP um, in 2012, and that really formed a basis of of what we've done now. So essentially, we're um, we're now working on expanding that. So the second study, um, and this one's funded by GRDC. It's in the final phases now. We're currently writing up results and trying to get some publications together and all the rest of it. Uh, they wanted to use LCA to <coughs> identify opportunities 
for mitigation through practice change. So how can people do things differently and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of their cropping products? Um, so what they did, they, there was um, four comparative greenhouse gas life cycle assessments that were done um, for New South Wales. So there was a, a wheat-wheat rotation to a chickpea-wheat rotation for both Moree and Walgett, so northeast New South Wales and northwest New South Wales. Um, there was sorghum wheat rotation um, east of Moree and down in the Liverpool Plains where poor sorghum growing region, uh, region. For Wagga Wagga there was a wheat wheat rotation and modelled with a canola wheat rotation. And then down south, so around Young, I guess, yeah, sorry, you guys might not be up on the geography of New South Wales. So further, further south near Victoria, um, a wheat, wheat and looking at high and low synthetic input, so synthetic fertiliser input. Um, and once again they used primarily, um, used primarily uh, gross margins from New South Wales DPI as input data, but they also went around and spoke to, well an important part of the process was um, <coughs> going and doing workshops with farmers and running running things by farmers and actually getting some data from farmers to make sure that what we were doing reflected what was happening in the field. Um, some of the tests, so this, this work was done by Sally Muir, um, who, who's been the DPI as well, this isn't my work. Um, <coughs> she uh, looked at how fertiliser management practices, machinery types, fallow management, how those things impacted on greenhouse gas emissions intensity. And she also said, well, how does, what are the fallow emissions versus what are the, the emissions essentially, what are, what's emitted in the fallow period versus the crop period. Um, so what she what she found for, um, this is North East New South Wales, so Liverpool Plains, Canada type area, uh, you had an, had an emissions reduction if you planted canola and, and chickpeas before your wheat versus doing a wheat-wheat rotation. And essentially that's because you get a bit of a, a yield kick from both canola um, and chickpeas. So chickpeas is obviously the biologically fixed end. Canola is the, I guess it's mediated by a number of things, you know, um, glucosinolates and things like that from the roots and um, high, high nitrogen, um, high nitrogen contents of, of crop residuals that eventually feed back into the crop. Um, so showed, you know, from about two, 220 for a tonne of wheat if you're doing wheat, wheat, down to about 140, so that was a significant reduction. Um, but also most of the emissions there, the, the dark grey were fertiliser emissions. Um, so this one they, they assumed the use of big N and hydrous ammonia, I don't know if you guys do it over there. Um, so that was assuming anhydrous ammonia um, was used as the, the primary end source. Starter Z was just there to give it a bit of a, a kick and showing a bit of uh, P and K in, in addition to the end. Uh, Northwest New South Wales, so this is up around Moree where you get, you're getting much drier, um, still heavy clay soils, um, but much lower yields as you can see from there. So. Um, once again, you were getting lower emissions intensities uh, if you grew wheat after canola um, or after chickpeas compared to growing it after wheat. So, and it's the same mechanism. You're getting biologically fixed end, or you know you're getting that new benefit from the uh, from the canola of the break crop. And most of the emissions, once again, came from um, on-farm emissions from fertilizer use. So. The nitrous oxide from denitrification primarily as well as um, some CO2 in this one because they used, uh, they assumed urea was used further out west instead of um, instead of the anhydrous ammonia. So that was, uh, that's some of the work out of the, the LCA one. Most of, that L, most of that one looking at those comparative systems has actually been finalised. So we're just writing that, final, writing that final report up. Oh, why only residue decomposition. Hang on a second. For six months. Oh yeah. I knew there was going to be some I knew there were going to be some things, some questions. What I might do is, uh, David, I might leave this until the end and we can talk a bit more about some of the assumptions that life cycle assessment modelling uses because it's certainly not a biophysical model. It's one of its big downfalls. Um, but as I said before, it's it's making relative comparisons. So 
I'll come back to your residue decomposition um, question, and I'll, I'll make sure I can clarify. I'll clarify with what I'll clarify with you what you mean first before I try and answer the question. So the the study that I'm focusing on. Oh, what's going on? Hang on. Sorry, can't change the slide. All oh, right. Come on. Sorry, people. I'm just a bit of a te few technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Damn. Come on. So bear with me. Right, so it's working now. Okay, so I'll just briefly talk um, about the national project that we're doing, and this is the bulk of our um, this is the bulk of our LCA work at the moment. So I'm working on this with CSIRO um, and also a private contractor that's based out of Melbourne. That's the kind of the LCA guru. Um, so GRDC have funded um, us to look at uh, a number of things for each of the, the um, each of their AEZ, their agroecological zones. Um, <clears throat> so the initial intention was for all four of them, but really uh, Queensland Central, Burdekin, Atherton, and WA aren't uh, true grain growing grain growing regions. They basically throw them in there as a bit of a break crop against their sugar cane or Whatever, whatever veggies, whatever else they're growing, kind of thing. So we're just focusing on the ones of the, the primary primary zones, which are kind of south, southeast, southwest Queensland, all the way through to WA, um, and then a bit down in Tas. But I don't know how you go about that either, because they've got a lot of veggies and poppies and other bits and pieces. So it's an unusual mix. But anyway, we'll have a go at that. Um, so the objective of this of this project is essentially to try and develop greenhouse gas mitigation strategies for cropping systems. Um, so it's picking up some of the work that Sally's done and getting that framework um, and then applying that to each agroecological zone. There will be differences. But I'm, I've got no doubt that some of the results that come out of this national project will differ to some of well will differ to Sally's work as as the application of LCA to cropping systems unfolds, we're learning more and more and we're picking up things and, and treating things a bit differently. So it really is a moving piece at the moment and where you know New South Wales DPI has taken the initiative to try and be on the at the cutting edge of this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so yeah there, there will be changes. So really we're going to look at the emissions intensity of wheat for each uh, agroecological zone but then look at things like well how does Sowing legumes, um, out of that impact on the greenhouse gas emissions intensity, those kind of things, um, and I guess one of the outputs that we'll we'll have is that uh, there's there are actually databases, an Australian database. So if somebody, for example, wanted to know what was the environmental impact of baking a cookie in Perth that they were selling, um, this will actually provide inventory for this database. Oh, where'd it go? This will actually provide inventory for that database. So we're, we're developing more than just a research project. There's going to be outputs that will be going out there. They'll be made public, and people like Arnott's and or pasta makers will actually be able to use this the information that we're building. Um, and I guess some of the the greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies they're all going to, and it's, it's pretty obvious they're all going to fall around um, reducing your nitrogen fertilizers. Um, and I guess nitrogen use efficiency is the best way to do it. But any way that you can improve your nitrogen use efficiency is the way it'll do. So I don't know if you guys use it over there, but if people want to try and use um, split application for uh, for growing wheat or for growing any crop, so then they have precision end management. So they have they're making sure that nitrogen demand is met by nitrogen supply, and it's not a nitrogen oversupply. Um, and there's the potential of increasing um, legume rotations, perhaps, and things like that. So I guess you know, really, when it comes, I've thought about, I've been thinking about this, obviously, quite a bit, and I think it will all come down to, to precision end. So whether that, and 
that will that will be pre-sowing test so you know what your what your inorganic N is it's sowing and then um, estimating what you're going to or how much it will get locked up by the stubble, how much you expect to get mineralised throughout the growing season and then only putting, you know, having your target yield and then only putting on enough end to make, make sure you meet your target yield. When you put it on will be a different matter, um, you know, but you don't want to oversupply it with them, I suppose. And so in my mind that will be the, and I, I guess that's something that people have been talking about for a long time but it can be costly. So what the driver for practice change for people to start doing that um, will be, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to try and guess it. Um, and I guess there could be other things out there that, you know, I haven't thought of yet. I'd be keen to look at variable rate technology. Um, probably not a, probably not a big deal over there with you guys, if I understand. You've got pretty uniform soils. Um, whereas, you know, when you when you have big landscape differences over on our side of the country, you know, moving kind of from um, mid-north New South Wales down to Victoria where you can have some pretty big landscape effects on soil texture. Um, VRT, you know, could potentially uh, provide some benefits there by only putting on as much end as needed for that particular area, you know. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot that we need to think about, but I think it will all really come down to um, efficient use of, of fertiliser in. Um, so where New South Wales DPI is focusing on the um, is focusing on the greenhouse gas emission side of things. Um, so life cycle strategies, which was the, the contractor that we were talking with that I, I mentioned previously, um, located in Melbourne. He's going to look at other impact categories such as land use, water use, eutrophication, and stuff like that, and build it into um, build it into the LCAs that we build. And I guess, you know, we, we really, and that's one of the purposes of LCA, we, we really need to take a, a holistic approach. So there's no point having a great greenhouse gas mitigation if you're going to be putting a whole heap of some other toxin into the waterways or into the soil. So that'll just allow us to balance, um, to balance the environmental impacts out against greenhouse gas mitigation. But knowing that the majority of the impact comes from, um, not only the majority of the impact comes from fertiliser N, well obviously you know, we're going to see some um, benefits if we become more judicious in our, in our fertiliser use. Um, and CSIRO are actually developing an impact category. So an impact category is a measure, um, I guess, of, of the impact. And so they're doing one for soil function. So soil health, soil function. So what, when, we're, you, when we're in our modelling environment, and we develop a model, and then we we hit the button, and it will it will punch out various um, indicators or impact categories. And so, what CSIRO are doing is one that will look at a combination of soil erosion, soil carbon, and another thing that I can't remember. But that that will allow us to build in things like um, tillage type um, or stubble burning. Um, you know, things it, it, look, it, it really adds another natural resource management indicator out of this model so that we can start looking at things more holistically or, yeah, to a, I guess to a greater depth. And, you know, considering the soil that Australia's got, um, soil health is probably one of the key things that we need to take into account. So, anyway, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope it's been informative and, and people have, uh, well, it's got people thinking anyway. Um, David, did you want to um, ask that question again because it's disappeared? I can't. It was something about. Um, it was something about why only residue for six months or something?
Hi everyone, we seem to have lost Aaron at the moment, so we'll just try and give him a couple of seconds to hook back in and hopefully give him the microphone again to answer Dave's question. If there's anyone else with any questions, feel free to type them in down the bottom and Aaron will be able to answer them as we go. Back to you, Aaron. Can you hear me, Joe? Can you hear me now? Hand up somebody if you can hear me. Okay, cool. Thank you, David. Radio. So, okay, life on minimum 12 months. So, I hope I'm answering your question uh, properly. Um, I need to think about this, actually. So, really, because this isn't a biophysical model, we need to make assumptions on the boundaries of things. Um, so realistically, if you want to look at um, decomposition of residue, it's going to be supplying in and it's going to be putting, um, you know, it's going to be emitting carbon dioxide for longer than the 12 month period. So for the work that Sally did, she assumed that, um, she assumed that the, so it, was, it was for 12 months at all, and it's just a general assumption as well, but I'm, I'm thinking about it, that all, um, all in was released from residue and all residue decomposed between harvest and the sowing of the next crop. So that's the assumption that is being made to date that really I think we need to start hooking LCA up, LCA up with biophysical models and somebody in France has done it and actually using the outputs of the biophysical model into the LCA but then you're using model data to go into a model. So you bringing, um, you know, you're potentially adding more error there. So it's something that really needs to be, needs to be weighed up. So anyway, look back to your answer. Um, the, re the residue, de the residue, all residue is, is assumed to decompose between harvest and the sowing of the next crop and any nitrogen or any carbon that is associated with that residue is assumed to be emitted into the atmosphere or cycled through the soil um, by sowing of the following crop. So if that answers your question, David, just put your hand up for me. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Right, yeah, I saw somebody else put their hand up. No? This is typing. I, yeah. Oh, look, I'm, I guess there's people still there. It's 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 got a lot of it's got a lot of flaws. I mean, any modelling approach has a lot of inherent flaws, but it does have a lot does have a lot of strengths. I guess when I started working in it and looking at cropping systems, you know, we're modelling a biophysical system. It's not like not like modelling a factory. You know, there's a there's, it's a lot more complex, and there's a lot more. We're trying to model stuff for a region as opposed to one factory, you know. Um, so, yeah, it does, it's difficult, and it does have a lot of it does have a lot of flaws. But I think it does have a lot of potential. Um, and you know, you just can't go out there and say, well, this is the duck's nuts, and this is this is the be all and end all, and this is our result. You really do have to put it into uh, you really do have to put into context of the system and the life cycle assessment framework that we're working in. So, like anything, you know, politicians may pick up something and run with it, and they've totally misinterpreted it. Um, but hopefully, it hopefully it leads to some informed policy decisions around climate impacts as well as other environmental impacts. Well, if there's no more questions, um, Joe, I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Aaron. That was great. Um, we seem to have had a few technical difficulties. So we have recorded the session and I will put the link out to all of the people that registered. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Uh, it was really good and I'm sure there will be some other questions that may come through for you.
Um, just before we go, I'd like to thank We've Got NRM for their technical support of this event. And if you do have any questions, feel free to send them through to me at joewheeler at we've.nrm.com.org.au. And thanks everyone. I think we'll sign off there and yeah, feel free to send through some questions afterwards. Right, uh, thank you everybody. Bye.